It's really important to protect these ecosystems because they protect us. That's the bottom line. If we forget that, you know, these mangrove forests were protected because someone worked really hard to do it, then we're going to miss the most important lessons that guide the future. We live in one of the most beautiful places in America, and to preserve it the way we found it is the most important thing that we could possibly do. We are here in this amazing lodge on Key Wayden Island, which is a very special place because this is the place where the Conservancy was founded. This is the original location of Lester Norris's cottage, and it was on the steps of the cottage that that small group of Collier residents decided to stop the road to nowhere that would have destroyed Rookery Bay. The Conservancy began when a group of citizens back in the mid-60s said, we don't want to see a road going through Key Wayden Island, connecting Naples to Marco Island. That would be an environmental travesty. And from that, we were able to save an enormous portion of Rookery Bay. Since the very beginning of the Conservancy, you will look back to our Road to Nowhere campaign that founded the Conservancy, and you see the concern for growth and development and its impact on natural resources. And even in the 1960s, people questioning, will Naples become the next Fort Lauderdale? And recognizing that we need to develop smartly and that while we're not opposed to development, we need to make sure that the development is directed into areas that have the least impact on our natural resources, on our wetlands, on our wildlife. Other examples, I think, of how we found the balance by you know, fighting on principle and then coming up with a great compromise is Pelican Bay. Pelican Bay is an award-winning community, right? I mean, it has won all these awards for design, primarily because there are extensive mangroves existing. There are walkways to those mangroves. That didn't happen without a fight. The Conservancy was concerned with the standard development practice at the time, which is you fill in all the wetlands, you go right up to the coast, you build the high rises, and you give everyone a beautiful view. Together, the Conservancy and Westinghouse basically co-designed Pelican Bay. And today, you see the benefit of that. You have functioning mangrove ecosystems in there. And those systems, by the way, played a tremendous role in protecting that community during the hurricanes that this area has had in the last 10 years. There are so many lessons that we can learn from our past work. It's all about really that tug of war of protecting the environment, nourishing the economy, growing, allowing development, but making sure that this is still a, a quality of life place for both people and for wildlife. The Conservancy's history wasn't linear. Basically, we've gone from land acquisition into wildlife recovery and education, and then much more into how we develop this area of the world and how we deal with some of the issues relating to water, and particularly how do we protect the wildlife that we have here. When you think of the tools in the toolbox to accomplish those three initiatives, you really have education, science, policy, and wildlife rehab. And our hope there is to develop internally a conservation ethic. Think of it as sort of like your internal compass that guides your decision making for the rest of your life. Education plays into the mission of the Conservancy because it truly is the heart of that mission. Without the education team, we wouldn't be able to share what we're doing here at the Conservancy. The community just simply wouldn't know. And the whole purpose of making sure that there's conservation efforts is so we can have this for the future. Making sure that we are preparing our future generations for future environmental stewards, future scientists. We need to get everyone around to appreciate what nature is and what we're actually striving to protect. 
For the Conservancy's Policy and Advocacy Department, we try to take the best scientific information, legal information, and uh, the letter of the law, collect that information and distill it down for the purpose of informing and educating our decision makers, whether that be at the local level or even up to the national level, to advocate for our natural resources here in Southwest Florida. That could be everything from writing a position paper, to reading scientific literature, to going out to the field to see it with our own eyes, or even taking that information to, to public meetings and testifying. With other organizations or agencies, they're constrained by either political will or the clients they work for. And they can't do the basic research that helps them manage. We can do that, and that is really cool. When I started in this business, you know, people would ask me, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I, you know, I work for the Conservancy, and I'm working in the mangroves trying to figure out why they're dying off next to raw uh, developments. Fast forward to today, now people's attitudes have changed. They want to know what they can do to help the mangroves. If you didn't have mangroves, you're not gonna have fish. When a storm comes through, it actually breaks up the water and that protects us. It can take a hurricane after hurricane after hurricane, it keeps coming back. That's the poster child for coastal resilience. I mean, what other species does all that? We went from just simply saying, okay, let's put cages over these nests to, well, let's find out where these turtles go using satellite tags and collecting DNA for researchers to trace their genetic history, taking advantage of opportunities to do some research and learn more about these animals. It's also very important for us to continue to keep protecting these nests. If we stop tomorrow, said, okay, we're not doing this anymore. The eggs that are laid on this beach, the productivity of this beach is gonna go way, way down. If you went over to the east coast in, of Florida in the 1980s, you might find 40 green turtle nests. This past year, there were about 130,000 loggerhead nests in the state and almost 77,000 green turtle nests in the state. Without these people doing this, and monitoring nesting and keeping track of this, this wouldn't have happened. We have one of the most important Everglades restoration projects here in our backyard in Collier County in the Picayune Strand Restoration Project. It's tremendously important because it's gonna hydrologically restore thousands of acres of wetland habitat that will recharge the bioregion. And the Conservancy has been involved since the early inception on making this a reality. Today, 20 years later, I was flying above Picking Strand in an airplane tracking Burmese pythons. I've learned to not underestimate this invasive species. They are a wildlife threat of our time to our native wildlife here in South Florida. And we are pretty proud of working with the other departments here to share this information that we find from these research projects and educate the future generations here because this will be a multi-generational approach to these issues here. There's only one Everglades on the planet. It is a gem, an ecological marvel. It's something we need to protect and preserve this area for generations in the future. Our part of the work done at the Wildlife Hospital in terms of the wildlife rehabilitation that we do, it's all interconnected with the other aspects of our work at the Conservancy. Not only are we taking care of these animals, but we're needing the advocacy and the science to help keep those areas safe so we have a place to, to release them back into. The work that we do and the impact it has on the environment is just so important because every animal does play a role. And it doesn't matter if it's a common species or an endangered species. It's just 
so important to try and help people understand our actions affect other things and the simplest changes can make a difference and make it better for the wildlife and therefore the environment. I think the future of the Arc of the Conservancy is one that these three core initiatives, which is coastal and community resilience, enhancing and protecting and encouraging the Western Everglades restoration, and then taking care of our native wildlife and try to restore biodiversity, are gonna to continue to be the guiding lights of the Conservancy. It's maybe the best place overall from a quality of life standpoint that I've ever lived. And we want to keep it that way. And the only way you can do that is the right balance of people, education and arts and so forth. Awareness comes through involvement. Involvement could be with the Nature Center, it could be with other environmental agencies, or it could be just becoming uh, in the community more aware of what's happening. You know, I've introduced a lot of people to the Conservancy, and I did not know it would be the best thing that they ever did, and they still talk about it. And, you know, they're out there, and now they're becoming volunteers. It's neat to see how people can figure out what they can do to stay involved, and nothing is too small, whether it's, you know, donating the towels from the local hotels. Everybody can get involved and make a difference. It needs to be not just the conservancy at these meetings, but every single person who cares about the environment, their quality of life, and paradise, their home. Celebrating 60 years is a way to remind ourselves that the collective impact of a few people growing to a dozen, to hundreds, to thousands, really can shape our future in a positive way. And that's the hope, I think, for our community, is that there is a way forward. And celebrating 60 years will remind us of some of the really important lessons we've learned of what has worked and what has not worked. And if we can apply those into the future, we'll all be better off for it.